Welcome everyone to the Early Warning Systems for Health Decision Making here at the Climate Registry Pavilion. Thank you so much for joining the session. My name is Amanda Quintana and I'm with APT Associates as their Climate and Health Technical Lead. And um, we have hosted this session with NOAA, uh, USAID, and AGU, uh, along with APT Associates. So thanks to all of our co-hosts for helping us pull this session together. So it has been well established that extremes in the climate system have significant impact on human health. We've seen that throughout the COP this year, health being a theme um, means that we've been talking about the interlinkages between climate and health for a very long time. So I won't bother you all with that background, but we have seen country national adaptation plans and health national adaptation plans, better known as HNAPs, particularly mention the need to prioritize early warning systems for health, specifically on infectious or vector-borne diseases such as cholera and malaria and non-communicable diseases. And what this means varies in by country context, and we'll talk about this a bit more in our session. This past summer, we had a wonderful conference hosted by AGU, the 2023 Climate and Health for Africa Conference that represented 15 African nations and US government entities, the World Health Organization and the World Meteorological Organization and others that came together to share the research gaps and application needs in early warning for heat and infectious disease across Africa. There are several advancements in early warning systems for health. We have heard throughout the sessions here at COP that there have been some new projects with extending current early warning systems such as FuseNet for health emergencies, for example. We've also seen new programs with the integration of climate and weather information into DHIS2, which is a national health information systems network. Um, and also specific projects that are utilizing climate and weather information to help um, identify health risk and outcomes that have tailored messaging through heat and health maps that we'll probably talk a bit more about today. For health decision makers to make informed decisions to protect the health of the well and well-being of people from direct and indirect impacts of a changing climate and extreme weather events, climate and weather information and services must be available, accessible, and most importantly, utilized, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Climate-informed forecasts, disease modeling, early warning and predictions exist, and if scaled and invested in, there is a potential for such climate and weather information services to effectively guide local health decision-making and public health responses. Yet many of these early warning systems, climate services, which we will get into a bit of a background on, um, have mixed experiences with end user engagement. So the uptake of these uh, climate services that have been created is a challenge. And we'll talk about that um, in our discussion today, but we also want to focus our discussion on what has worked well with the end users. What are some lessons that we can draw from and that will conclude our session so we can identify the best approaches to enable the use of climate information to improve health decision making and how to scale solutions. So before we dive in, I'd like to turn it to Ben Zajcek, who is representing AGU, and I'll let him introduce himself briefly, um, who will give us an important background on what we mean by all of these terminologies and maybe when we would need which. So when would we be talking about what? So these are early warning systems, climate services, advanced climate and weather information for health, you name it. Um, so I'll turn it over to Ben to give us a bit of background. Thanks. Great, thanks so much, Amanda. And uh, so as she mentioned, I'm Ben Zeich. I'm here representing the American Geophysical Union, the world's largest uh, association of earth and space scientists. Um, and yeah, in keeping with the informal conversational nature of the session, I just wanted to address some topics that came up as we were preparing. Um, so, I think, Amanda, you introduced this really nicely. We're putting this in the context of climate services. And to make sure we're all on the same page about that, that refers quite broadly to information and products used to inform uh, improved resilience, improved capacity to address climate variability and change. In that context, we talk about early warning. And so we're not now talking about just a prediction, like how well can we forecast a disease. We're talking about how do we create a real suite of usable and used uh, information products. So I think that we're all on the same page there. The next thing is the term early warning. So what does that mean? And in some senses, in some contexts, I should say, um, that's used in a very specific way, right? Like an early warning could be like a heat wave early warning system or a malaria early warning system that's trying to predict what's happening in the next weeks or months. And that's really important work with some welcome attention paid to it that we'll discuss. 
I think that, in, based on our conversations preparing, we also want to think about early warning in a broader sense. So yeah, there's a specific thing, like can we predict an event and in a usable way, uh, but also early warning a sense of, sometimes this is simply, not simply, but sometimes it's about assessing risk in general. Because very often what a user needs is to have a good concept and a good, uh, at the right resolution, at the right uh, level of granularity, uh, and information about who's vulnerable to climate. And then you can respond to an event or make plans that as you need to without actually a literal forecast, like in the very conventional warning sense. And then additionally, obviously under climate change, uh, we're talking about early warning in a broad planning sense. And so in that, as you described, that's talking about kind of projecting things forward and understanding how we can, uh, can best adapt. So just wanted to set that scene because it caused some confusion for us when we were preparing, so therefore it might cause confusion in the audience as well, that when we talk about early warning systems here, we're talking about climate services over multiple timescales using multiple tools, all intended to create used products that enhance resilience, not just kind of some s prediction in a very narrow sense. Back to you. Thanks so much, Ben. And yeah, maybe we want to think about this as the conversation evolves of maybe thinking of the end user and how they would be using this type of information in a sort of bubbles. So you have warnings that could be helpful for health operations and day-to-day -day, um, decision making for health district officers, for example, even medical professionals. Then you have preparedness as a bubble well, with, you know, if in case a flood comes through, what are the things that we need to do to be able to respond appropriately and continue our service delivery? to then long-term planning that would affect policy, that would also affect financial line items um, at, a, at a national level. So when we say end user, it is not one specific end, it is multiple ends. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our diverse set of speakers who are all bringing a different perspective. And when I turn over the question to each of you, um, before you dive in, if you don't mind introducing yourself, so your name, um, you know, your affiliation and title, um, but also your perspective that you're bringing. So are you from the Met Service? Um, are you working with an international organization? Are you an academic researcher um, in your introduction? So uh, the first question that I'm placing to all um, the speakers, and we'll start with Casey and Shari, who are online and joining us from different places, and thank you both for joining us um, so early in the morning, will be, Please, could you please speak to the perspective that you bring to the topic of climate information services and health and relay one example from your work or experience. And if we need to switch to the slides, we can do that. So over to Casey first, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Casey Ernst and I am a, an academic. I'm a professor at the University of Arizona. I'm actually an infectious disease epidemiologist, so I'm really speaking about this from the public health side. And I started out in applied public health and then moved into academia. So I wear a little bit of both hats. Um, I do understand the perspective of applied public health personnel because of that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a disease system that I've been working on, dengue, and just sort of the the evolution of my perspective about early warning as I have developed um, throughout my career. And so when, when I first started out, you know, as an infectious disease epidemiologist, one of the things I really wanted to understand is how is weather and climate change going to influence the geographic um, distribution of Aedes aegypti and dengue um, and some of the other arboviruses that they transmit? And then how might that change some of the temporal patterns as well? And so started really doing a deep dive into more of the biology and, and trying to get that science understood so that we could actually develop systems that could accurately provide forecasts. And so some of the initial work that I did was looking more at the long range forecast. So, you know, what's going to happen in 2060, what's going to happen in 2080, and these larger geographic scales. Because I was working at the applied um, level as well, <clears throat> in talking to my partners there, you know, they said, well, this is really interesting, but this really isn't relevant to what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we're, we're responding to something that happened yesterday. We can't think about something that's going to maybe happen in 30 to 40 years. There's so much uncertainty. We have so few resources. This is not really going to be as as beneficial to us as something that would be um, sort of more more near to what we're responding to. 
And so um, working with my other, I, I usually work in a, in a team of, of scientists. These kinds of questions require uh, people from diverse disciplines. And so we started working on a model to try to predict Aedes aegypti abundance about one month in advance, because that was sort of the time scale that our partners were saying, hey, this is this is more, this is better for us. This is a time scale that will actually allow us to take some action, um, give us a little bit of a heads up, mobilize some resources, et cetera. And so that's what we started working on. Um, and since that time, you know, we have developed a model that relatively accurately bends into high abundance, medium and low. Um, and we're trying to move that into more of a, uh, an actual usable format for our decision makers. And at the same time that we're working with applied public health and vector control, we're also trying to work with the, the public um, directly because a lot of these disease systems, if you think about it, you really want to mobilize action, not just at a governmental level, but in the community and with the public. And so getting that information direct to the hands of the public so that they can protect themselves um, is something that we're also really keen on trying to do and understand how to how to move that forward. And so I'll, I'll, I'll end with that, but I think that, you know, our project is still evolving. Um, I think we've had a lot of challenges and we've had a lot of lessons learned along the way, and I'll be happy to talk about those in, in uh, as the conversation unfolds. Thank you, Casey. Over to you, Shari. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Shari Kovats. I'm also an academic and I'm an associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and Topical Medicine. And we work quite closely with the public health agency in the UK um, developing some of their extreme events uh, warning plans. It's called the Adverse Weather and Health um, Plan. Um, and I'm an environmental epidemiologist, so more focused on the non-infectious side, but we've worked around heat risks and, and flood risks. And they're kind of two main ways that we contribute to working with um, public health agencies. And one is identifying who's at risk. So within a population, who are the high risk groups? And it's worth saying that we're very limited about what data we have in terms of identifying who's at risk. So we're quite good at um, sort of individual sort of demographic factors and disease factors, but what we don't get and no country has is, you know, where people are working and where people are living and their type of housing situation. So in terms of targeting people, we have some real gaps in evidence, but we can look at settings as well. Um, and we can, so you can target messages, not just at people, but where people are living. So care homes and things like that. So it's very important that ev messages linked to warning systems are evidence-based. And that's a different type of research around behavior change. And we've been doing some work looking at how you target messages to particular groups, particularly older persons, because we know there've been a lot of messages that just haven't worked. So um, telling people that they're vulnerable is not a good way to communicate risk. So there needs to be a huge investment in sort of behavior change research to make sure that any messages that are linked to these warning systems are actually effective. Um, the second thing we've been working on is the evaluation and that's essential as well. As Casey said, you know, there's quite a high bar you need to reach in order to demonstrate that systems work within a health system because they're so under pressure their resources are so limited and there's always an opportunity cost when you're bringing in a new intervention. So you need some robust economics to show that it's cost effective. These warning systems are whatever um, time lag you're using, whether short term or, or kind of medium term. So we need to do these evaluations as well. And I think that's really been lacking, but we have been doing some evaluation work in the UK. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we really got the public health perspective from both Casey and Shari, which is really great. And now I'm turning to the room for our in-person speakers. I'll start to my right, if you don't mind introducing yourself and answering the question. Thank you so thanks much. Thanks very much, and uh, hello, everybody, and thanks for having me here. Hello, Casey, how are you? <laughs> OK, so I am uh, Usman Jai. I am the director of the Med Service in Senegal. But I'm here, I guess, because we were developing uh, an early warning for heat waves. As you see, climate change is happening and uh, heat waves is getting more intense and more frequent. 
Uh, now, I mean, as you rightly said, the, the really bottom line question is how to deliver a message that really can allow action. Take the right action to save life and uh, goods. That's really the, the challenge. And it's a quite huge challenge. And I'm saying that because the easiest path, if you are engaged in this uh, uh, framework, is just uh, having the model, the climate model, and, and the health model working. But if you start working with people, it gets more and more difficult. Because remember, it's really a cross-disciplinary work. Many stakeholders at different levels. So the thing you, you, you want to pinpoint clearly is to know that, uh, differentiate what is your uh, uh, user. You have a user at the decision making, it's much more easier when you have the government, the ministry, in terms of drug conservation because of heat, if you need the planning in the long term, having climate change projection, how things will go, how disease will evolve in different areas. If you take malaria, for example, you can see some areas are prone to malaria now, but with the evolution of uh, temperature and uh, rainfall, some other area will be endemic of malaria, for example, those kind of things. So it's much more easier. When we take in population now, going down to really population, you need to separate, I'm talking about vulnerability now, separate populations that are really uh, affected by directly by your early warning. For example, heat waves that we know, we know that elderly people, pregnant women, you know, ch children, two years less, and people having some kind of disease, some people are really vulnerable. So you need to know where they are. And you need to know where they are and what kind of message will you send to them. Another level is public services, public, I mean, no, uh, uh, public health services. Because when you're doing these, these heat waves, uh, the thing is you need to develop, you know, a collaboration and also uh, uh, trust that is very important in these kind of things with the health service, talking to them. I remember the beginning, it was very difficult to interpret their data because at the med service, we know if a missing data is there, we have a code for it, and we record the data exactly at the same time, same moment, and the health service doesn't do that. So it was very difficult to confront those kind of data. It was kind of very difficult things, but we need to aggregate the data and, and go forward. But now, when we are talking now, we're telling them, okay, we, need, we know how to make our forecast. We know what kind of things we are forecasting and where, but we need to go to the dissemination. Now you need to identify the channel, the right channel, the right message, introduction. They understand exactly what do you mean. And there you think that that's where working into pluridiscipline is very important. That's where social people are very important to work with. How people perceive things, how people understand things. How do you, you know, educate people to understand? And we went through with them together. If, of course, it was not our, our expertise, but we need it as climate scientists to understand really the decision-making system. And that's very important, why people are taking such a decision in time of disease. So we went to the community and have a pilot project. That's always how we work. Now I'm giving a concrete example. So we went to the, to the city, and uh, we identified people working with Red Cross, because Red Cross are very efficient on just sending messaging, and working also with the disease uh, uh, district, district of uh, uh, disease control. And then we have an early warning of heat wave, so we was able to focus the heat wave, and knowing which period is it. But we need to understand how people will behave, how people take decisions, what people are affected, you know. What we perceive at the, at, uh, in, uh, in the science is really uh, translated into action. So we send messaging, text messaging, yes, text messaging, and we send a few, you know, volunteer of Red Cross to tell people that, you know, uh, starting from tomorrow to three days, it'll be heat wave. And then, afterward, we collect some data how people were behaving. It was another thing also to collect the data. Where do you collect them? We need public transportation, restaurant, different places, many, many places to collect as much data as we want, you know, just to ensure that we're really getting some feedback from population. Of course, we have also some questionnaire survey that we sent some people that they would respond to tell us how they leave the heat wave, what was it. It was interesting for us as a med service to get the feedback. It's not just to get the forecast right, but understanding where to put the threshold, for example. What is a heat wave? As science, it's very easy, 99 per, per percentile, very easy. But you know, it's much more complicated to people making decisions. So you need to get the feedback and to redefine again, reset again your threshold, how, how is the heat wave? How long is the heat wave? Will, uh, will, what kind of decision people are taking? We learn a lot. We learn, for example, from sport. People, you know, doing some trainings and outside sport, outdoor sport. It was very important, you know, for them because they have hours they, they get out. In Africa, for example, it's under the, under, under the heat, and it was, uh, it was difficult. And also, the medical support system, uh, I mean, the facilities, 
when heat waves, they understand that they will get more and more patients coming in. So they need to organize better themselves, you know, how to do that during those periods. And they didn't have the means to do that. So it was another, another challenge. Public transportation was not following. And one interesting thing really struck me was the school. Our school system are opening just in the heat period. And actually, during that heat waves, the governor of the region is a, is a district manager from the government, call us and tell us just reports that in two schools, some people just fainted because of the heat. And he makes a correlation, actually, and calls and says this will be important. So it's really important to make it usable, as you say. I like that term, really. Easy to use, making people that they're taking decisions. And then in Africa, in this context of Africa, people need to prepare. Preparedness is our, 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 our best strategy. We didn't have means really to deal with it. So we need ahead of time to prepare. And the time scale is important, you know. People need it, for example, for tomorrow, how they will, you know, behave. People need it in the long term. Because sometimes in the, in the health, what they, what they, they, the decision is made a year, a, a year in advance, you know, to order drugs, to prepare everything. If we tell them, no, this, uh, this month is going to be very, very hot, they say, yes, but, you know, we already get the order done. So we, we cannot do anything. So it's really important to understand the mechanism that is put in place. Thanks very much. Absolutely. So bringing the attention back to actually understanding decision-making processes from the end user's perspectives is very key for uptake of, these, of, the, of the information, of course. I'm going to skip you, Ben, for a moment and bring it to Brahma. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Brahma Kone. I'm the regional advisor in charge of climate change and health at the regional office of WHO in Brazzaville. So yes, uh, by training, I'm sanitary engineer, environmental epidemiologist. So, and before joining WHO two years ago, I've been a lecturer, researcher on watch, climate change adaptation in the watch sector. As I already said by my colleagues, I will not again stress too much on that, but one thing I, I got from my groundwork on watch adaptation to climate change that really catch my attention is related to the specific vulnerabilities of communities. How from a global risk that is evaluated, we got to specific outcome depending on the way a specific group or individuals behave in face of a risk factor, because that is making a difference when it comes to strategy to adapt, anticipatory adaptation. You no more only stretch only on the health system, but knowing the specific vulnerability factors, what in the behavior of a specific community can protect him or increase his exposition to the risk factors, you may strategize better, and that has a financial and economic impact. Very important, we can uh, stretch on in already weak economic countries. So going down to the specific vulnerabilities is something for me really important. And to do that, you need to work, as others said, in pluridisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams. One second thing I want to rely on, in addition to what has been said, is how we communicate on what is coming from the models. Those uncertainties, are there things that communities themselves can catch? When you are talking with someone and telling him, what I'm telling you, there is a probability that it will not happen. What are you asking him to do now? Shall he act or not act? You as scientists, you may know 5% uncertainty, I may most probably act. But for a community who already is challenged by means to cope with, you are telling him there is a possibility that what I'm telling will not happen. How shall he act finally? So there is a need there to work, and I will say this is where I'm also, I, I can also see a huge need for multi-sectoral work. 
I'm not sure in our countries, the technical teams who are working, for example, with social scientists, with journalists, when it's come time to talk to communities. We generally get out from our laboratory and we want to speak the language of the communities, but we are not trained to do so. Any business you want to make successfully, you need to be trained in. And this is something that is really calling for our multidisciplinary transnational work. Another thing I want to emphasize on, and that is mostly related also now to my new position as a regional coordinator. And based on example of early warning and response system, we have been supporting Ethiopia and Mozambique to implement since 2017. When we say EWAS, this is a decision-making tool. How it comes out a decision-making tool is not led by decision-makers, but by technicians. We technicians decide that for this country, we need an EWAS. Yes. Based on scientific evidence, we are mostly right. But how to make this become a led process by the country? This is where we should start. By not just coming as technicians, starting setting our EWAS, working on models, coming with output, and when we, we got now our output, we go to decision makers and want them to become the ones who led the process toward when they were not requesting for the service. So there is definitely a need in our way of approaching this issue. When we are scientists, we know definitely that this will must happen. We need to anticipate through EWAS. Our first work should be to get the decision makers led this message. When this becomes the priority, we now as technicians, we go back in our silo, start working on it as technical people. But we make sure that we got the agreement, the understanding of decision makers, we are sure that they, led the they lead the process, and we work as technicians to come with a result for them to take over. And if we are doing so, many challenges we got, for example, in our region with those countries we were supporting. How is that a, a, a decision maker led process will miss just a computer, and move forward on. There is no need for that. If really this process is led by decision makers of a country, but by policy makers, buying a computer to ease the process in the country shall not be a huge business for them. Because they are using money for many other things that may not be so important if we succeed in showing them how important is this process. So these are a few things I want to stress a bit on. Uh, in fact, as I said, my colleagues already make a so good um, wrap-up of what is going on on the technical side and how we can um, improve our process to make it easy for decision-making. I just want to flag those key points. First one, specific vulnerabilities. That can help us gain fun. Uh, to, to get uh, enough funds to act uh, effect effectively and efficiently. Second, how to communicate on those uncertainties? Mm -hmm. We need to communicate with people who are trained to do so. Mm -hmm. The one who is trained to do models, he has to work on his models. When he finish, the one who is trained to talk with people, he needs to look for those ones and not himself going and talk because certainly he may even not see what are the weakness in what he's saying, but surely, if it was done by someone who is training for, it would most probably be more impactful. Mm -hmm. And last, it needs to be a policy-led, a decision-making-led process. Mm -hmm. If we want it to be more successful in terms of upscaling what we will do in a specific part of a country, I will let it there. Thank you so much, and thank you for wrapping up your key points. The last point on decision-making-led processes, I would love to dive into in our next round. But before we get into that, Ben, if you have anything else that you'd like to 
add for your introduction? Sure. Thanks, Amanda. And it's very tempting just to dive right in because that, that was great to do that. So let me just put one more thing on the table. So again, so I'm, I'm here representing the American Geophysical Union. As that title suggests, I'm coming to this like Usman. I'm a, I'm a physical climate scientist. Um, and like Shari and Casey, I, I'm an academic right now at Johns Hopkins University. Um, and I will give one example that maybe compliments we just talked about, which is work that we've done um, with health ministries at, in numerous countries on the problem of enteric infectious disease. So enteric infectious disease, right? Um, until recently, the leading killer of children under five worldwide. Now it's number two. Um, and it's a hodgepodge of a class, right? It's anything that creates a, a diarrheal uh, symptom, symptoms, um, but it's a huge number of different pathogens that, that get the kids. And a, a challenge for us in trying to integrate environmental information systems and climate systems to, to predict these um, is knowing which bug it is, right? Because the pathogens have really different sensitivities. So we had this unique opportunity to collaborate with a number of uh, health experts led by my colleagues Margaret Kosick and Josh Colston, um, real experts in, in, in infectious disease, with data from around the world at Sentinel sites where we could actually get pathogen-specific predictions. Okay, great. So then we said, this is amazing. We should work with these ministries. And everyone said, yes, let's do this. We got some funding, thanks to NASA, to say, okay, let's put this together with the satellite data, with the climate information, to do early warning mm -hmm. on, on infectious disease. Um, then we got the funding, and we started doing this. We're like, okay, we're going to try to predict this stuff. What's the time horizon? And then the ministries that we were working with came back to us and said, we don't, you know, congratulations. Now we have the money. Let me tell you something. We don't need a forecast. Like, that's not what we're looking for here. What we need, we should understand the distribution of risk, right? And so... We just changed course, and what we just said is, okay, as much as, as, much as I, we love the intellectual challenge of creating an early warning system, what we need here is something that's really characterizing risk in a pathogen-specific way that allows for things like emerging vaccines to be prioritized into different regions, understanding the basic seasonality for getting supplies that, as you say, often with a long lead time, so telling this is going to be a particularly bad year isn't useful, because by the time you can say that, it's too late. So just knowing the seasonality, knowing the distribution. And so that led to uh, some systems that now we hope are going to be useful and that we're working with folks here, the end users are the those responsible for distributing vaccines or distributing supplies at national scale. Um, and what, we are, what we're delivering to them now are, are basically static maps, because that's, that's what they wanted, um, and that's what they're using. And so it was a case where um, we went into this thinking about, okay, what's the best early warning system we can build based on our science? And then came back and said, well, no, what really what we need to do is work on an integrated communication system targeted to the end user that doesn't even require the forecast uh, and instead is more of a, of, of a mapping of risk. So just want to introduce that in the context of what everyone else said is that in thinking about, you know, get the right tool for the right application. Thank you. So I was, I was writing notes um, very quickly while each of you were speaking because I think we're all saying very similar things coming from the experiences that we have. Some key takeaways that I captured is that obviously we need to, we have a lot of information available, but the needs are not matching <laughs> what is available. And that may be because we're not engaging decision makers at the very start and trying to understand what it is they actually need. But it can also be, and I would, I would argue that, you know, being a, a public health professional, that public health people don't completely understand why they would need this information. So there's a communication issue within decision making more broadly to have, I guess, some training and education on what can be useful in integrating climate and weather information. How can it actually protect your, your health activities, right? So that, that is one entity. And then if you do have them on board and you bring them in, Having a decision-led process then also will have issues with connecting what's available, the funding that is, uh, uh, you know, it, most of the time is opportunistic, as you described, Ben. You know, how do we connect those gaps? And maybe we can talk about bridging in general in this next round. And I'll, I'll go to the screen first because I know Casey and Shari, you've been listening intently online. Um, if there's anything that you want to jump in and say, feel free to do so. This is an open discussion now, but I want us to focus on the end user experience and talk more about what can work, right? What are the solutions that we can bring to the table to funders who are looking to create early warning systems for health that are in all of these policies and that will lead to funds that will be available. We are in a space that's working really quickly now, so it means that we need to have these opportunities and solutions at hand. And it seems like we're still trying to figure that out because our communities are so siloed. Um, so yeah, open it up to whoever would like to jump in first. I'm looking at the screen. 
if Casey and Shari, I think you have the raise hand function if you want to speak, but I think you can also just jump in. Shari, you, you have your hand raised. Over to you. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think those points that have all just been made are excellent points. There's clearly an issue in capacity um, strengthening within the health systems. You know, we've done some interviews around um, infectious disease surveillance and whether it's using climate information and there's just a lack of understanding of the benefit of climate information and how that could support current global health strategies. You know, it's clear that more, you know, just focusing on on research and developing systems outside the kind of users and the health systems isn't sustainable. There's so many early warning systems that have been developed and then it just aren't used anymore when the research project ends. So, um, and there are lots of examples like Ben has given where there's kind of seasonal global health interventions for vaccines or malaria. And as the seasonality is changing, it's not just that the seasonality is changing, but the seasonality is becoming more unpredictable, which is making these interventions less efficient. Um, and so there's an urgent need to address those issues. And then remember that there's still some gaps in terms of data. So the data that we need for identifying vulnerability is very difficult. So there needs to be investment in uh, information systems, robust, you know, supporting infectious disease and non-infectious disease surveillance in, in lots of countries so that that data can then be used because there are limits. For some early warning systems, you need quite high resolution health data that's just simply not available for dengue, for example. And then um, I guess the, in the longer term strategy, this, this investment now within the attached program of national adaptation vulnerability assessments, getting the right climate data for those vulnerability assessments, you know, make sure that it's locally or, or regionally relevant. And my final point is it's not just about the climate data as well. You know, other environmental data is really important. Some land use data, um, pollution data, you know, we've got um, great opportunities with better data coming online, particularly from remote sensing systems. So if you're going to develop a kind of comprehensive surveillance system, you need to look at other environmental determinants and not just the climate ones. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I would I would echo that as well in terms of the the need for building not just sort of that capacity for early warning, but for actual surveillance programs. Because you're you're in if if you're developing early warning systems using surveillance data that's spotty, that's biased, that's not complete or robust, your models are also going to have those same flaws and 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 echo those in terms of compounding uncertainty. And I think with with developing these models, a lot of times we only have, you know, a, a few opportunities to demonstrate their effectiveness and utility. If you are telling people, hey, you really need to go and um, do your, you know, expend your resources in this specific region or this specific area, and that turns out to be wrong, you know, you, you know, I think that's an, another conversation that really needs to be had openly is what is the uncertainty? What level of uncertainty are the end users willing to to take and then if it's you know if the model is too uncertain then it it, it shouldn't be deployed um uh for for decision making and it needs to be sort of continued to improve upon the the surveillance piece as well um the another point that i'd i'd like to make is that it really is a team that needs to be put together here. You know, I think as as was stated by others quite nicely, um, it's it's one thing to have a technician who knows how to build the models and and create the models, but translating that into action is going to require a, a whole different set of of individuals. And no, they can't sort of work in their little box and then hand it off. It has to be a real effort where people learn each other's language, where you know how to understand at least the basics of those models, to understand the basics of communicating those as well. So there has to be sort of a, a Venn diagram among the team members for these kinds of systems as they're, as they're developed so that you have a little bit of those skill sets, even if that's not your, your specific expertise. 
Um, you know, the system is beyond the model. I mean, it, the model is only the, the you know, the, the small aspect uh -huh. of trying to develop these and, um, you know, certainly trying to get that, that sort of broader comprehensive system requires a, a really significant engagement of, of multiple folks. Um, I'll stop there and let someone else chime in. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I like the way that Brahma put it uh, <laughs> in the user perspective, what you call demand-driven product. I think it's, uh, it works both ways, as, as you said it. Uh, sometimes, as a data scientist, what we want is a good publication sometimes. Yeah. Whenever you give us money, more computer, the data is never enough. We want to have this station, measurement, this and that. And then we are uh, overlooking, really, what is, a, what is the purpose. Uh, but I think, really, the middle uh, thing is to have what you call a core production. Both are important. I'm pretty sure to, today in Africa, if you want to save people that are really suffering, they don't know that what they are happening to them is related to climate. They don't know. They may suffer a disease, but they just suffer the disease. If you want to wait until they create the demand, you will never have a demand. Because they don't have no clue what they're happening is just related to climate change or disease or whatever. So we need to go both. We need to have ensure. I think the best thing is we need to work to have the two community getting together. That's really the purpose. One community will not solve it. Both have to sit together and try to find a solution. And sorry to go to another example that really works for us. It was in agriculture. Sorry, I'm going to be ahead. When we was doing an agriculture early warning, and it works really, where we started is forgetting about our climate. I was in a group forgetting about the climate scientist, whatever, and sit with farmers and ask them, what is the decision making? What they are doing during the season? Why and why they are taking that decision? If the farmer is saying, it, I would go first, to prepare the farm, why? What make you make the decision I prepare today or not tomorrow? And they say, yeah, when I start seeing the first cloud, things come, start to make sense now. When I prepare the first cloud, I, I'm pretty sure that it's coming. And I will go to get the seeds. How do you get the seeds? I need to have the money, I need this, I need that, and I'm going to plant. Say, why, when do you go to plant? Why not planting this date or not that date? You say, I'm waiting until to have the first rain and to ensure that the soil is moist. Now the demand is creating. So that what, what those kind of things we need to put together to ensure that both communities are sitting together and to dive into the problems and now trying to problem focus. Of course, of course, we are doing an early warning and we, need, we know that what's really uh, the starting point is really the climate information. That's where we have the memory. We ensure that we have some climate indicator, whatever it is, El Nino, on ocean, whatever. And when it you know, moves things and then the season starts and this and that. So that's why we need really to ensure that the climate information is enough. And as you said it, for example, uncertainties is a big problem. But us, our climate scientists, we know that uncertainties is always there. We, never, we have to do with it. You know? And then now the question is how to uh, communicate this uncertainty in the decision-making system. You have to make decisions anyway. So m sometimes what I'm saying is you have to make a decision. Can you make a decision without any information and having also an information that's not sure, but at least having something? That's really the thing. Not saying it's just uncertain. Yes, it's uncertain. Everything is uncertain. Climate change, if you go, it's like this. If you go to seasonal, it's like this. If you go to weather, but there's always uncertainties. But how? How to take this uncertainty in the decision-making system? That's really the challenge. So what I'm saying, again, is just to have those two communities working and to make a core production and then an issue. And there, everybody have a place, as you say. Social science, I think, has a real, real uh, uh, role to play in this, in this one, and everybody has this role. Thank you. Absolutely, and, and you're just getting me to think about, in our global health programming, right, there is a lot of, a, we work in uncertainty all the time, but the alternative is that no action is taken, and then they're inundated with, you know, a flood that came through and has changed their activities. So in Mozambique, we had an example of one of our projects that's an HIV AIDS program that was affected by the cyclone that came through earlier this year. There were floods that happened afterward, and there was a cholera outbreak. So now an HIV AIDS program that was supposed to be delivering antiretrovirals is now having to respond to cholera, do flood risk mapping of hospitals. And they don't have the climate and weather information available. They didn't have the relationships on the ground to make that happen. And they're using their very limited funds to do these activities. So, you know, they don't know about all of the issues with climate and weather information that they might have access to create these maps. But is it going to help them the next time a cyclone comes around? Because a cyclone will come around again in Mozambique, right? Maybe. And I think that's the uncertainty piece that we need to also communicate 
and at all levels, in, my, in a national health system, a local health system, but also with our health programs as well. So, I mean, I'm opening this up. I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that too, but over to you, Brahma. Thank you so much. Uh, I will stress a bit on three key points. The first one again, I need to come back to the leading leader in the process. And I will give you an example. Some years ago, when we were starting a program on wash management in a peri-urban precary area of Abidjan in West Africa. Before starting the project, at the beginning of the project, at the inception of the project, we got a meeting with the community leaders. We present what we want to do, and we ask them what are the priorities to move forward. They tell us, you know, the government want to relocate us from here because this is not a place we shall settle in. They want to relocate us. Our priority for us is how you can support us to go and negotiate with the mayor so that they will not relocate us and we will remain here and we are happy to work with you on your wash issue. Because wash was not the first main issue. We then start explaining them. You know why they want to relocate you? Because this place, you are not managing very well your waste. You are polluting the environment. This is creating disease for you and for your neighbors. And this is why they want to relocate you. So if you want the mayor to let you here, let us work together on the wash and you will see when you will be able to show to the mayor that you clean your area, that is becoming good to live, you will see they will let you hear. From that moment, those community leaders were the one going and telling all the decision makers, you know, we are working with scientists. They are supporting us to improve our area. Please let us, we will show you. In two years maximum, you will see what will be the outcome. Our research, our scientific questions become the priority. And this is the thing. In fact, we are the one trained as scientists. We are the one who should know how to go and work with community, with leaders. We are the one who know the process. They may not know, but there is a need for us to build the capacity. When they got the sense of what we are coming with, you can even be the big boss, but you remain behind them. And you show them they are the one who are leading the process. At the end of the day, you will see how easy they will take forward whatever will come from your work and take it over. So it's a matter of how to deal with those guys, even if you are the one who know the thing, how to let them feel they are the one leading the process. And then it is to everything. Second thing I want to stress on is the capacities in our region. We are talking about climate and health. How many climatologists who are interested in health do we have in our region? I'm not a climatologist, but as I'm working with them, I know they are not so much. <laughs> <laughs> you got the point. <laughs> they are not so much. When I was still there, when Jacques André and John himself, you may see. We were just two, three persons in the whole of West African region I know very well on climate and health. Now, when you go on the health sector side, who are the public health workers who are interested in climate-related issues? Very few. So from our side, as WHO, our challenge is how we get well-trained people in our region to support the process we are moving forward with. Because we are very few, and the challenge is becoming bigger and bigger. And I'm, I'm already a bit stressed. I know from this scope, because now we got a health day, I'm quite sure the member state will come with m so many requests, mm -hmm. because they will want to show something at the next scope. Mm -hmm. And when you take the African region, I'm the only one at the regional office as a regional advisor. No one I'm working with. How can I deal with 47 countries? When even in the country, we don't have enough people to rely on, mm -hmm. to delegate. So this is one 
challenge. The last one, and I will make it rapidly. When you look at models, I think there is something to do there. When we look at infectious diseases, I may not be aware of all the models existing, but I know there is good models to predict malaria. Some models on meningitis. The malaria one is a couple one. The vector model, the liberal malaria model, that are associating both uh, the disease and the med side things to move forward. But from there, for other diseases, what do we have to predict how the disease will be in 10 years, in 50 years, in 20? I think there is still there a room for work. And I'm seeing it as a huge challenge. Because generally, fundamental, they just make it in the last year, but they have been working on it so far. So this is also where I'm seeing a challenge for us to come with, those with more accurate models the existing one, but with new models to tackle all other diseases that are around. I was so happy to read a paper just a few weeks ago on how one can be the main environmental factors um, controlling the, tra the, the, the distribution of cholera outbreak from one continent to another one. How the one can be the one need to work on to get out with a more global control of some of those diseases we are facing. So these are the three points I want to, to stress a bit on, and thank you so much. You haven't come around to speakers on one or two key messages that we want to communicate around early warning systems or climate information services for health. It's focused on the end user. What is the need? What is the next step here? Because as you said, and as we've seen at this COP, the demand is coming, and it's coming in an overwhelming manner where we don't have enough trained, knowledgeable, intersectoral workers in this space. And funding is, maybe that could be part of your key uh, takeaway. So we'll s start with Ben, over to Casey, Shari, Usman, and Brahma. Thanks. Great, thank you. So, uh, so many questions I've got for a co-panel, so we're gonna have to follow up with over coffee. But, uh, uh, on, the, on the key takeaways, again, putting back on my American Geophysical Union hat, as you mentioned in opening, we had this meeting back in the summer that I think that was a, a useful convening. Um, and now especially, as we know, that the, the, through the convening held here, policymakers are going to be asking, right? We're going to see this demand. And so what can we do to advance the kind of do this? And so I, I would say that as we move forward, if there are going to be funds and interest available, let's think about how we bring the right communities together and really see statements, but it's actually getting into the weeds and saying, okay, here's, how, here's who we need doing what and who needs to be at the table. Casey? I'll just wrap up with saying that, you know, I think in general, starting with the end users, making the end users the beginning around. Um, yeah, I want to support what Ben said about having a strategy and, and, in, and in making sure everybody's engaged and, investment in the health system in terms of training health workers and uh, also support for the health surveillance systems as well. Great. Osman? Yeah, in, a, in another note, we have it. And now also we have satellite, we have enough data, you know, so we can use that. So there are, there are a few nice things. So what we need is just to fund those two entities. I would say we need more climatology and the disease. And from WHO uh, perspective, we need to work more together and to get concrete case studies that have made proof in somewhere. I was so delighted when I hear from this heat wave um, thing you are working on in Senegal. And I asked Ibrahim Masi to document this because we as WHO, we need such kind of concrete examples that are working so that we can just move forward with other countries that may be interested. So yes, we need to work together to move forward our agenda. Right. And that's that. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone um, for your, who's joining online and in the room. And thank you to our speakers online um, and, and our speakers Hi, in the room. Hi, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate everyone joining.